Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our informational session about First 10 Community Schools. It is lovely to have all of you. For those of you who I might not have met previously, I'm Leanne Larson. I'm the Director of Early Learning in the Department of Education. And our team is the team that is helping to support the first 10 community school work. So we're really pleased that you are interested in learning more about this work and the opportunity that you will potentially have an, a chance to apply for. Um, and I want to uh, start by setting a little bit of context for this work. Um, and then I'm going to be handing it over to David Jacobson. David Jacobson from Education Development Center, who works with our department on this initiative. Um, but to start off with, um, I wanted to, to say that, as I think most of you coming from Maine are very much aware, our department has a very strong focus on supporting the whole child or the whole student. That thinking about all the different um, domains of development that contribute to a child or student growing into a really um, healthy, capable, well-adjusted um, youngster is super important to us. And we want to make sure that everything we do in our schools and our communities is helping to support that um, growth and development. One of the ways that we have seen that can make a big difference in accomplishing that focus is by thinking about the concept of community schools in general. And um, if you don't know a lot yet about community schools, one of the real hallmarks of a community school model is the way in which the school works collaboratively with their community partners to support children and their families in being able to address the whole student or whole child. So we've been, whoops, oh, yes, sorry about that. My once in a hour drop. Sue, can you tell me where I left off? We lost you for about three seconds. Okay. So we, you were all, right. we're, we're all good. Okay. So um, one of the ways that we've begun to really start exploring and investing some resources in is a community school strategy. And we've been looking at some different models, um, one of which is the first 10 community school model. And that's the one that we're going to be sharing with you this afternoon. Um, our department probably five years ago, six years ago now, had some grant funding where we had gotten this model started um, with 13 communities across the state. And um, we had just kind of gotten them going and then the pandemic came along and it kind of derailed our work for a little while, but we've had the good fortune of being able to be recipients of a preschool development grant from the federal government which is enabling us to be able to restart this work. And um, so last spring, we offered an opportunity for school systems to apply and awarded three first 10 community school grants. And so those three um, schools are up and moving forward with their work. And it's our intention to fund three more community, first 10 community schools, so that we'll have a total of six under this particular grant opportunity. Additionally, the department is has some resources to help support um, just a more general community, kind of traditional community school model. And so there will be some resources coming forward in the not too distant future, probably a few weeks after you see this one posted. Um, that will be another opportunity. One thing that we want to sort of clarify at the beginning of today's session is that um, if you're thinking about a model where you really want to reach down into the early years and, and think about connecting your birth to school entry realm with your elementary programming, 
then a first 10 community school model might be the direction that you'd want to go in. And you're going to learn a lot more about why that might be this afternoon. If you're looking to focus more squarely on just the span of time that your community or your school serves, whether it's an elementary, a middle, or a high school, then the more traditional community school model might be the direction that you would want to pursue. So that's some decision making that you'll have to do on your end as you explore the different options that are available to you. Um, one last thing that I want to also do this afternoon is to introduce, um, before I turn it over to David, Sue Gallant, who you should be able to see on your screen, um, who is um, splitting her time currently between supporting one of our preschool expansion grants, but also supporting our first 10 community school work um, as a point person in our department. So Sue will be working um, hand in hand with EDC and um, our team and the school teams to help um, provide resources and support to them as they progress. And you'll also see on the screen this afternoon, Anne Hanna and Julie Smythe, who work on our community schools um, grant work. And so they're here so that they can hear more about First 10. And our intention is to make sure that as we move this whole body of work forward, we're, that we're really working to connect the pieces. So that's really important to us from a department and the systems wide stance. So with all of that said, I'm going to turn it over to David, and he's going to um, spend some time walking through the first 10 community school model with you. And then as we get toward the end, we'll talk in a little bit more specifics about the um, RFA opportunity that will be released probably at the beginning of next week. Oh, and David, you got to unmute. <laughs> Yep, <laughs> I didn't want to uh, make noise during your um, during your introductions. So uh, it's great to be here. Great to see all of you. We are very excited uh, about this opportunity in uh, in Maine. And so before before I go on, I'll just introduce a couple of my uh, EDC First Ten colleagues. I'm here today with Akira Gutierrez, uh, one of our First Ten team facilitators, and Akira is currently uh, supporting. Limestone Caswell, and also uh, the East Belfast uh, First 10 Community Schools. Uh, also here with uh, Erica Jews, who um, uh, uh, from EDC, who is supporting our Sanford uh, First 10 partnership in Maine. And uh, uh, so we've got Akira and Erica, who have some good Maine experience. And uh, Taylor Passmore, another of our First 10 team facilitators, is uh, on the call as well. And um, uh, Taylor, Ak Akira, and Erica were all with uh, us and when we did a summer institute with those three communities this past summer. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I'll just wanna say that we do this work in six different states, many different communities. We've done it in over 50 communities. And what is uh, very exciting is that Maine has designed, I think, an extra special uh, initiative. I have used the term, there's some Maine special sauce in this particular First Tent initiative. And we'll share with you what that is. Um, and, but think of First Tent as an opportunity for a community to come together and really deepen your supports for children and families. Uh, through what we think of as an action-oriented partnership. So what you would be doing is creating a partnership in your community between a school and early childhood organizations to together jointly implement strategies, in effect, to harness the efforts of multiple organizations in your community. If it's a small community, it may just be, you know, one or two um, early childhood providers and your elementary school, uh, maybe your Head Start program, um, so that you're all rowing together, implementing strategies together, harnessing each other's efforts to have an overall bigger impact. And we have found that to be the case in multiple uh, places. There is a position 
um, that comes along with this grant opportunity, and that's the main special sauce. And you'll see that there is a graduated um, uh, a funding that, um, and, and we'll talk about that and that role a little bit towards the end. But before we do that, we want to make sure you have a good understanding of what First 10 and a First 10 community school is. And so I'm going to start off, I'll share a little bit of research, uh, just a snapshot. Uh, we're going to explain what First 10 is, we'll explain the grant opportunity, and we'll have time for questions. And we're a small group, so we can keep it informal. Please stop me as I go. Uh, you know, we can, we can, uh, we we, we want to hear from you and, uh, and make sure that we're answering all your questions. So with that, I'm gonna uh, share my screen. And okay, you should all be seeing a title slide. Uh, great. Um, so. Akira, Erica, Taylor, and I are all from the Education Development Center, EDC. We are a mission-driven nonprofit focused on education, health, and expanding economic opportunity. And we're part of a large uh, portfolio of uh, colleagues working on early childhood and elementary school education and care. And we draw on that expertise as we do this work. So as you think about First 10, Think about, I think it's helpful to frame it in terms of three big ideas. The first idea is that research supports a community-wide approach to the first 10 years. And that is, by that, we mean bridging early childhood in K-12 and bridging education, health, and social services. The second big idea is that innovative communities across the country, both communities that uh, we've studied through applied research, as well as the uh, approximately 50 communities where we've implemented our transition to kindergarten and first 10 approaches together create a uh, roadmap. And that roadmap addresses teaching and learning, partnerships with families and comprehensive services. Some initiatives focus more on the partnerships with families and comprehensive services side of things, others on teaching and learning in classrooms. We, we Our reading of the literature is that all three are important and we focus on all three. And the third is that First 10 provides a framework, a planning process, and a set of strategies to guide local partnerships. So let's get to where what that framework is and what those strategies are. Um, I think it's always helpful to uh, ground this work in the fundamental challenges of poverty. We have a consensus in the United States that in order to address the challenges of poverty, it's important to start early, but how we do that is important. Uh, and so we know from the research that children need consistent quality each and every year. No one year of high quality, let's say pre-K, is adequate to the task of addressing the challenges of poverty. It's important that we have multiple strong high quality years. We need alignment across the age span such that each year builds on the learning and care of the previous year and prepares children for the learning and care of the next year. And we need coordination across education, health, and social services. So this we know from really decades of research. However, our early childhood systems, our, what we sometimes refer to as our uh, early childhood local, uh, our local early childhood systems, uh, are often fragmented. They're often characterized by gaps and disconnects, gaps between zero to five and K-12, between education, health, and social services, and between public programs like schools and Head Start programs and private community-based programs. So let's pause there for a moment. Like I said, lots of uh, mixed delivery systems um, tend to be fragmented. There are disconnects and gaps. And I'm just wondering if I could ask you, we're a small group, I'd be interested in hearing from you in your work in your career, have there been times where you've bumped into this kind of fragmentation, where, where you have bumped into these kinds of gaps and disconnects, where you feel like, gosh, if we were just a little bit more connected, and if we were more coordinated, we could do better by children and families? So I'd love to open it up. Anybody give a good example? 
Since nobody else speaks, I'll take up the airtime, but I'll just say um, just today, our experience with trying to navigate the social services network with a family, right? And um, behavioral health and whatnot is a challenge. Yes. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. No, that is a, a challenge we often hear. How about others? Um, so I work for CSD 13, Dear Al Stonington, and School Union 76, which is also Brooklyn and Sedgwick. And um, mm -hmm. I used to run adult education, and I helped bridge that gap. I had um, an early childhood person working for me, who actually also met with every family that had a newborn and mm -hmm. provided re links to resources and that sort of thing, basically a navigator to services. And we all had this great developmental library of developmental toys um, and workshops and things um, that got kind of messed up by COVID um, to some extent. And then also the person I had doing it um, isn't well enough to do it anymore. And we were really dependent on her because she actually um, taught Headstock down here for 40 years you know, is a native of the island. So whoever she wasn't related to, she basically raised um, in the early years. So she was so well connected. So we're trying to figure out how to like rebuild some system um, that would help with that. But that's a great example of addressing that need and addressing the fragmentation. Uh, 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 and I love that connection, that kind of family navigator role and, and, and in an adult education setting. So that's great. Thank you, Lynn. Any other examples? Well, I think. Uh, oh, Mark, and then uh, uh, Alyssa. I think uh, one of the examples I would just give is lots of times not knowing where the kids are prior to their enrollment into a public school system, right? So, yeah, you may not between between families who are raising their kids at home and somebody staying home with them to groups of families that share that role to daycare providers to Head Start programs, um, just knowing where all the kids are and being able to just have direct communication, I said, I would think that would be one of the areas we've seen. That's a great, that's a great example, Mark. And that is uh, exactly the kind of issue that we really try to work on in First 10. So uh, thank you for that. And Alyssa. Um, I submitted a child find referral recently to CDS um, to find that the same family had had eight different points of contact in the community mm. over a period of two or three years that had all resulted in a referral. Um, and none of those organizations had releases to speak to one another or aware of the child find work that one another were doing. None of those referrals led to right. taking them either, which is a different problem, but um, that's a lot of um, you know repetition in a service. Yes. Yes. No. Excellent example. Really uh, heartbreaking and but excellent example. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Alyssa. Thank you all. What great examples. So you have come across these good examples of fragmentation, and that's what we are trying to help address. So, um, so again, we know from the research that it's important to have continuity, consistency, alignment, coordination. However, our systems are fragmented, and as a result, children experience inconsistent quality, gaps across the age span, and a lack of coordination at each stage of development. Nationally, there are two movements working to address this fragmentation. Uh, uh, one uh, often goes by the name of birth through third grade or prenatal through third grade, and the idea is to improve quality at each stage of development and alignment across the years, particularly bridging the early childhood uh, elementary school gap around the transition to kindergarten. So that's one important movement. The other goes by the name, and, and this is what uh, Leanne is talking about in terms of an emphasis for uh, the Department of Ed and, uh, and the state, and that is the movement around community schools, sometimes called integrated student supports. Um, in early childhood, we often call that comprehensive services. Head Start has done this since its founding. And the idea is to use uh, preschools and schools as hubs to connect families to health and social services. So we have been uh, supporting these two movements for many years, both through technical assistance to states and communities and through applied research. And back in 2017, I received a grant from the Heising Simons Foundation to do a study looking at communities that 
we're having success with both of these initiatives. And so I talked to national leaders, I interviewed 18 communities, and I ended up focusing on these uh, communities, most of which I did extensive site visits at. And in 2019, I published a study, All Children Learn and Thrive, Building First 10 Schools and Communities. This is where I first proposed the First 10 model. I had already been sharing it, actually with some communities in Maine and some communities in Pennsylvania. Um, and then we have been sharing it quite a bit uh, since. And so I will uh, sh uh, sh share a snapshot of the model in just a moment. I'll say that since then we have uh, expanded, as Leanne said, we're going to be we're launching six communities in Maine this year. Uh, most of those, including our first batch uh, before the pandemic, uh, have been rural communities. Uh, so we have a lot of experience with rural communities. Uh, in Pennsylvania, we support we have supported 15 communities, all clustered in South Central uh, Pennsylvania, both urban and rural. Uh, 12 different communities in Rhode Island, mostly urban. In Alabama, we've supported a, a rural community and an urban community and are adding more communities uh, this year. And in Michigan, we've supported 12 uh, rural and urban communities um, uh, across the state, two communities in Massachusetts. And what's exciting is that we have a grant from the Kellogg Foundation that allows us to create a first 10 network. So our communities across our six states, and we're actually uh, talking to communities, a number of communities outside our six states, um, uh, but we're able to create a network so that all the communities can learn together. And that has been very exciting. It's been exciting to see innovations spread from community to community through that community to community exchange. And actually, actually your colleagues uh, from Maine uh, participate in those networks network uh, meetings, both your state level colleagues and our um, uh, and our three existing communities, uh, Limestone, Caswell, East Belfast, and Sanford. Um, so just know that that is uh, an additional opportunity. So here is the model in a nutshell. We begin with a commitment to educational and racial equity and the whole child. We summarize that in the expression, all children learn and thrive. By all children, we aim to eliminate disparities by income, by race, by other cultural factors. And by learn and thrive, we have a whole child notion in mind that includes health and mental health outcomes, social emotional learning outcomes, and cognitive and uh, academic outcomes. We then create a partnership in the community. And that partnership includes elementary schools and school district staff, uh, he, uh, community programs, including Head Start, um, community-based pre-K, church-based pre-K, uh, and families with the idea uh, that we're all interdependent and through that collaboration, we get better at what we do. Also participating community organizations often include libraries. Um, we make some great connections with libraries and other health and social service organizations. Uh, and then uh, we implement three broad strategies. Now, these strategies are going to be familiar to you. The words will be familiar to you. What I think makes First 10 distinctive is that we implement these strategies across the early childhood elementary school continuum. Hi, this is Angela Atkinson Duina. I was calling to schedule an. Uh... Okay. Um, we had an interruption, um, but. Uh, so what I was saying is that I'm going to share some of the strategies. What is distinctive about First 10 is that we implement these strategies across the early childhood elementary school continuum as part of a coherent plan and informed by the evidence-based practices of exemplar uh, First 10 communities. So I'll share those strategies in just a minute. Before I do that, I'll just say there are two uh, possible structures through a First 10 partnership. Um, we do have partnerships that are community-wide. In this main initiative, these are all going to be first 10 community school hubs. So here what we're doing is we're using the school, the elementary school, as a hub connecting to early childhood programs nearby, in the neighborhood, in the catchment area, in the town, as well as perhaps family child care providers, connecting to health and social services, and reaching out to families even before kindergarten, reaching out to families at birth 
through a variety of uh, uh, practices. So the first strategy is to collaborate to improve teaching and learning. And what we, what we really tend to start with here is developing a comprehensive transition to kindergarten plan. So all of our first 10 communities develop a comprehensive transition to kindergarten plan. If you already have transition to kindergarten plan, great, we will build on that. And uh, our plans really focus uh, first on activities to support children and families throughout the transition. But another big piece of that is bringing together our uh, community-based early childhood teachers, our Head Start teachers, and our district pre-K and K teachers for joint professional learning. So part of the grant is to pay for stipends for those teachers to come together and do joint professional learning. We have found that to be very, very powerful. We look at standards together, we compare instructional strategies together, um, and that's often when our partnerships really start to mesh, is everybody sees the value of that collaboration. So that's one piece of first 10. And I'll just quickly say for those of you who might um, you know, want to report back to district, other district leaders or uh, program leaders, just know that there's good research that says that when we invest in the transition to kindergarten um, in the uh, before kindergarten, so uh, in the, the pre-K and preschool year, that we have a lot of benefits for our kindergarten at the beginning of the year things that kindergarten teachers care a lot about. Uh, likewise, and these are both good rigorous studies, methodologically rigorous. Uh, this is uh, in, in a, almost a thousand schools, 17,000 children. The more we invest in the fall in transition to K, the higher our spring academic skills. So that is another important finding and something to maybe uh, share with your uh, district, uh, district leaders or program leaders. So we start the year off on a good start here. And we end the kindergarten year. This is obviously um, a gift to our first grade teachers, but also to those children and their families setting up those children for success in school. Our second broad strategy is to coordinate comprehensive services. Here we're talking about improving referral system, uh, deepening our partnerships with health and social service providers. And our starter practice here is to create uh, school connected play and learn groups. So some of you are familiar with these. I'm sure most of you are familiar with these. You know, they're similar to Head Start socializations or parents as teachers group connections. Libraries call them story times. And we take that good play and learn group model and make a few tweaks. So we bring together caregivers and their children. We do developmentally appropriate activities. We sing, we dance, we read stories interactively. We do some crafts, we do uh, movement, we do maybe some cooking. Uh, we build trusting relationships between our facilitators and our families. We always integrate some caregiver learning in a structured way. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, we implement these as a series, um, not rather than a drop-in, uh, often a series of six. And we emphasize three key connections, connections among peers, connections among health and social services, and uh, with schools. And so um, this is a great opportunity to connect families to health and social services are early. Uh, these peer relationships are really important. They're tied to important mental health outcomes and also help access resources. And we also make some great connections to schools. So we, we when possible, we do these at schools. And we um, we also, uh, regardless, we'll have a kindergarten teacher or an elementary school principal visit the play and learn, provide a warm welcome. We look forward to seeing you in a few years. Keep up these great developmentally appropriate activities. Read a story, uh, uh, have fun with the families. And then, um, and by the way, mention that kindergarten registration starts in March. So, um, so, we have had a lot of success with these play and learns. They're a great way, and they're a great way for our community partners to collaborate in a way that has a tangible impact on families early on. So here's an example of uh, when we did these virtually, uh, we are back to doing these in person. And our third broad strategy is to deepen partnerships with families in culturally responsive ways. This can mean um, 
uh, creating family engagement and partnership uh, structures. This can mean um, uh, doing outreach to culturally specific groups, elevating family voice. Uh, we uh, will hear often for our starter practice, uh, use our first 10 partnership to mount a community-wide parenting campaign. And the main uh, Department of Ed has prepared a, a menu for you, a menu of parenting campaigns that you can uh, select from. And uh, they have technology like uh, text texting services that then support the families around the parenting campaign. And so all the, the three communities will have a convening and will share the various parenting campaigns and the various texting programs. And that will be an option for your partnership to use some of your grant funding for that if you so choose. And we will then use the partnership to help amplify that campaign. Um, so that is another part of what your partnership can do. Uh, it's another way for your partners to come together around a common community-wide uh, objective in your community. And I think I have an example here. Um, uh, many of our communities use a campaign. This is just one of the menu options called the basics. And uh, it's based on these five evidence-based uh, principles. And the idea is to saturate the community with those five principles. There's videos and posters and tip sheets and a texting service, like I said. And regardless of what you use, which, which texting service and which campaign you use, and if you already have one, we'll amplify that. But the idea is to use the partnership to get everybody in your community, your churches, et cetera, your library, uh, even your elementary school teachers uh, thinking who are trusted messengers who can promote the campaign for younger siblings back at home and certainly trying to get your 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 uh, health care providers on board as well. So we will use our partnership to, in effect, saturate the community. All right. So those are the three broad strategies and a starter practice for each. Uh, now we have a new partnership in town. It's that it's important that we lead strategically and continuously improve. We will create a focus plan. So our work begins with uh, uh, asset mapping and needs assessment process. We have a template. We'll look at what are you currently doing. We want to honor that work. We want to build on that work. And then we'll draw on those practices and develop a plan for you and then implement that uh, plan. We uh, meet every three weeks. Uh, typically after school, we'll convene a first 10 team uh, we we ideally we will have teachers on that team. They can um, it's an option to you to stipend them for their after school time uh, using your grant funds. We like to have pre K slash Head Start and kindergarten teachers, just even one or two of each on the team. Um, uh, we'll develop the plan. We divide into work groups. We meet every three weeks to implement the plan. So uh, and we facilitate those meetings. We, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, the, our first 10 EDC colleagues will help facilitate those meetings. Um, and then all the plans have implementation uh, benchmarks in them to monitor our progress. So that's the first 10 framework. And I can pause there. I'll tell you more about the grant in just a moment, but let's just pause there. Any questions about first 10? before we get to the grant. Okay, let's let's dive into the grant. Um, so these are, uh, this is the, the three-year pilot project that Maine is making available to you. Um, a requirement is that each school hires a first 10 community school outreach coordinator, full-time first 10 community school outreach coordinator, and the RFP will have a sample job description, will have the responsibilities, not necessarily the job description, but the responsibility of that coordinator role. And you see the funding amounts, and it's, uh, so year one is 125K, that will include the salary for the first 10 community school outreach coordinator and to implement your plan. 
So the stipends for teachers, the stipends for the joint professional learning, paying your play and learn group facilitators, the books and crafts for the play and learns, and then paying for your parenting campaign, uh, for example. Though that's what that uh, funding is uh, for. And then the idea is that it drops, the funding drops each year while your community picks up the cost, a uh, uh, partial uh, uh, part of the cost of the community school outreach coordinator position. So that is the uh, grant opportunity. Um, and then you have a Department of Ed support uh, in the form of Sue Gallant and her colleagues. Sue will be the point person at the state level to uh, uh, support you. Sue has a lot of experience uh, she herself led a great first 10 partnership um, in our first uh, round of work before the uh, the, the partner uh, before the pandemic. So it was great to get to know Sue then, and I'm thrilled that Sue is uh, in this role, able to support um, all of you from the state level. In addition to you will receive our support um, uh, leading these meetings um, and organizing convenings, organizing a summer institute, et cetera. So that is the uh, specifics around the grant and uh, Leanne and others can uh, provide more context and answer more questions. So this gives you a good sense of some of the first 10 practices that we implement. These are these starter practices that I have mentioned. I'll mention one other. A um, lot of our communities, just as kind of a community building idea, will have their pre-K and K teachers vote on their, in effect, their top 10 books for four-year-olds, high quality books for four-year-olds. It's just a fun community building idea. We'll then buy those books for all the teachers of four-year-olds in the community, whether, you know, no matter where you're, how you're funded, church, preschool, whatever. If you teach four-year-olds, you get these 10 books. We're going to make a bookmark around these 10 books. Um, uh, Erica had the idea today of putting a label on the binder of the books <laughs> so that these are 10 special books that we really emphasize for four-year-olds. And then we have a list of activities that kindergarten teachers can do, knowing that some portion of their class have really had a lot of exposure to these books and then we'll buddy up children, uh, uh, you know, if in case there are children who haven't read the 10 books. We can get your library involved. Maybe they can create a nook and, and display these 10 books and have other transition to kindergarten uh, uh, activities. So those are, that's just a, a fun community builder that we, um, that we will uh, often do as part of our transition to kindergarten planning. So these are some of the typical practices that we do. This is what you're signing up for. Play and learn groups, connecting, family engagement, connecting to health and social services, connecting early childhood programs with elementary schools, um, working on improving quality, a big focus on the transition to kindergarten. And within that, the joint professional learning that I mentioned, we put a big emphasis on that and uh, aligning elementary uh, uh, grade curriculum and instruction. So this is uh, uh, a, a big focus of the work. And this is, I, I've kind of and uh, foreshadowed this, but we, uh, your teams will convene a first 10 team in your, around your school and in your community. And you'll meet with one of our team facilitators every three weeks uh, for 60 to 90 minutes to develop the plan. We then, Often we'll divide into two work groups. It depends on the size of your community. If it's a small community, maybe we all stick together in one work group and we'll meet every three weeks, um, whether it's one or two work groups. And these most meetings are virtual. We will do a periodic uh, site visit. Um, uh, Akira and Erica both visited their communities uh, uh, in October, had great visits, loved meeting everybody in person. Those are really important. Um, and then we continue the work virtually and they'll be visiting again in the spring. Oh, I left a end of a, a, a paren here, um, but the we will have the occasional virtual convenings. We did two this past fall for the first three. We'll do another two this spring. Um, we hope that someone from your team can attend one or two people. The whole team doesn't have to attend the virtual convenings, one or two people can attend and report back. Uh, we have our monthly first 10 network meetings. Those are voluntary. 
right? We are, those are purely, that is just an opportunity if you want to learn from other communities across the country. It would be great if your first 10 community school outreach coordinator could attend these. They're once a month uh, for an hour and a half on Fridays, and it would be great if your first 10 to learn from the other communities, your, your, your funded position. But again, those are voluntary optional offerings. And then we'll provide a one-day in-person summer institute uh, where we can all come together, uh, where there are three communities can all come together, the three new communities. And we did that this last summer, and uh, I think it was a, an effective day. Um, we moved every, 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 all the teams moved, moved forward and advanced. So there are two competitive priorities for this. Uh, uh, if you are a rural community or if you have economic need, and, um, and then we'll be looking at readiness. And we define readiness very simply. Uh, we know our early childhood, uh, typically our early childhood programs are eager to collaborate. What we're looking for, what we have found to be really important is district buy-in. That's, um, that is a critical component. And then if you have a history of collaboration, great. If you don't though, if you don't have a history of collaboration, but you have a lot of buy-in, we will, uh, you, you'll be able to build a strong partnership. This just gives you an idea of how we'll start. The blue is indicating where all three communities come together and the black are uh, the individual meetings of your teams. Um, and so we'll have, these are the convenings I mentioned. These are the every three week meetings, getting your plan in place. So just to give you uh, a sense of that. Okay, so why don't I stop sharing, and I'm uh, we will open it up for questions. Uh, and you know, Leanne and and state colleagues, if I've missed anything, please feel free to jump in um, and add uh, other additional important context. Uh, but we also are eager to answer any questions you may have. We did have a question in the chat, and oh. Ben, if you could provide a little more detail, are you talking about applying for the grant, or will the grant communities have the opportunity to yeah, work together? Yeah, thanks, Sue. So my question was like, you know, if I'm here in Old Orchard Beach, and we partnered with a SACO or a Scarborough to apply for the grant, would that potentially improve our chances, or is that too much work? Sue, you probably know better than anybody, but um, what... Are there opportunities for districts to work together on this grant, or are they district-specific or community-specific? That's a really good question, Ben. Um, so the way we've structured the RFA is that um, a school system would apply on behalf of one of their schools. So if you only have one school in your district, it would be that school. If you had multiple schools, you'd decide which school. If you happen to have some small schools within your district, a couple of small schools that are reasonably sized and could share your family outreach coordinator, then you might have a couple of, of elementary schools that could participate from your district. Um, it's probably less likely that you would be um, coordinating across multiple school systems. I will say that we do in the first um, three awardees that we had, we did have, we do have an example of two school systems who are sharing one family outreach coordinator, but they are very, very tiny schools and they share the same superintendent and they are located side by side. So it's made it a little bit more doable to tackle something like that. But I wouldn't want to say that that's, you know, you have to think about how much can one family outreach coordinator take on and working across multiple communities could become a little bit more challenging pretty quickly. And I'll just say from my perspective and from our perspective, you know, one way to think about this is that what makes sense for a transition to kindergarten plan in one district won't necessarily make sense for a transition to kindergarten plan in another district. We have found part of the success of our model compared to some other like regional early childhood partnerships is that we're, we're either at the school level or the district level. And that's where transition to kindergarten planning makes sense. And so um, for that reason, you know, what ends up happening is that we have to, we have to kind of 
split the meeting and do some transition to kindergarten activities, what makes sense for this school, and then other transition to kindergarten for this school. It, it, and so uh, from our perspective, particularly on that piece, uh, it, works, uh, it, it works better um, if you're within the same district. Thank you, Ben. Really good question. Other questions? Yes, Mark. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just trying to think through on the funding portion of it. So is it typical or has it been in some of your other schools that when you're talking about somebody who is being the coordinator that they're making an equivalent um, pay to like a teacher. Uh, and I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. Cause that would mean that it would be like, uh, you know, in that first year, 80 to a hundred thousand dollars of that money would go toward paying benefits for the coordinator. And then the other money is what you have to do the implementation. Is that a reasonable kind of assessment? That you're like spot on, Mark. <laughs> That's very reasonable. Yep. We found oh, that I I must have frozen. Whoops. Was that my mind froze, right? <laughs> of course. <laughs> I was just saying, Mark, you were spot on. Um, that's really very much like the uh calculation that we kind of used in setting up the budget is that it would generally be equivalent to like a teacher salary. Um, obviously, you know, you as the school system can decide how you want to do that. In one of the um, programs, they chose to make the position be year round because they felt that they really wanted that family outreach coordinator to work through the summer and be available to be doing those connections for children and families. And so um, they chose to build their budget around that concept, but they didn't have any difficulty with what was remaining, thinking about how they, they would support the other pieces that needed to be supported. Mm -hmm. um, and then as David mentioned, the design is such that in the second and the third year, the amount of money will be less with the goal that you'll be working to take on, how can you fund that position for the long term? Um, and that's something we'll talk about. What are some resources, strategies that you might employ to accomplish that? And maybe it doesn't all have to come from the school system side. Maybe you get support from some of your community partners and share the cost of that position. Okay. And There's when you certainly opportunity for other grants out there outside of the DOE to fund this work as well. I just got my Grant Watch newsletter today, and there had to be 12 of them that apply to main nonprofits and schools that have potential. All right. And, and as you look at that, um, and you said this is a full time position, is this full time position able to do more things than just this role, or is it full time position? focused only on this role, or is that specified? It, it's really a full-time position focused on this role. There's a lot to the role, Mark. Um, so there's plenty, I think, for the, for the position to be um, responsible for working on. And, you know, much of it will be that outreach and coordination on behalf of children and families in the school, helping to really shepherd the plan that you've developed, some of the time may be spent working directly in classrooms with teachers, pulling, working on the alignment pieces with educators in your school. Um, so in the RFA, you'll see a listing of the basic responsibilities of the position. And then obviously, we want you to be able to take that and customize it to a degree to your circumstances. Right. That's one of the goals and in, in how you develop your plan. It will be built around the context of your community. I, I think another important piece to keep in mind and that you'll see in the RFA is that 
Um, and David did mention this a little bit earlier, but you will pull a leadership team together to help collaborate around this work. And so part of your application will involve identifying members of that leadership team so that if you're successful with the grant, you've got a group of people who are ready to come together and get the work started. Can you give us a, just a preview of like an idea of what the deadline is going to be to get this application in? Yeah. So our intention is to release this probably on Monday of next week, and the applications will be due on February 1st. It's not an arduous application. <laughs> it's really, you're going to be responding to a few questions and then pulling together members of a leadership team. So it's it's not like... That's my concern is like these kinds of things I have to have approved by my board. Yep. They and you the first Tuesday of the month. So I would have, we've already missed December. Um, so I would have to get this to them in January and we've got Christmas break coming up. So yeah. we need to have conversations with my administrators very quickly. Yep. Yep. I would encourage you to do that for sure. And one other question I have, just as far as talking about the transition to K. Um, so that transition is from birth, right? So when you're thinking about that, you're thinking about from birth up through. So it doesn't really change your transition to K plan if you had universal pre-K or close to universal pre-K, right? You would still be functioning at all the different levels coming up through from birth all the way up. It's a it's a great question, and that has come up in one of our communities, Mark. So I'm glad that you asked that. Uh, in a case where you have universal pre-K, and those will work on two things as part of your transition to kindergarten plan. One, the transition into pre-K, right? So that those so, so those are children and families that you know you know that the district might not have worked on with, and so we will push that back. And say, what do we do to reach out to those families? And then we may do also some work between pre-K and K. There still may be value. And if those some of those pre-Ks aren't, I mean, some of them may be in the in the same building, but if they're not in the same building, we'll want to facilitate that transition as well. And then our other activities do start at birth. So the play and learns and the, you know, that can start, I mean, that can be for, you know, we can run it in it one for for zero to twos. And um, and our and our basics campaign is very much. I mean, it's zero to five, but zero to three is really important. I mean, sorry, I said for the parenting campaign, for any of the parenting campaigns, we really like to start them early. Thank you. So, yeah. So, yes. <laughs> I think one of the things too to think about, you know, the. The reason it's called first 10 is because you're focusing on those first 10 years of a child's life. The initial work really starts at that crux, as David was talking about, between the pre-K and the K. But over time, you're going to expand out and you're going to be reaching down into those early years. And you're yes. also going to be reaching up into those early, those elementary years and following children and making sure that that's coordinated and aligned. But you're not going to start it all at once. <laughs> you know, you're going to start with some tangible pieces to work on and then build out. Yeah, and that's Leanne's making a really good point. And th uh, there, we start with a starter. We have that starter practice. We found that a good way to get started on on uh, on collaborating. But we really do want to then, you know, push down more and push up, and and based on the needs of the community. And in addition to following those children, that may mean me making additional partnerships to make to make sure that those elementary school children and families are getting connected to services to the extent that you have them, you know, in, in your community. So we really want to emphasize that's a, a great piece of the role. And then, you know, we would love to do, we love to push it up and do transitions, um, you know, not just between pre-K and K, but between K and one and, 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 and one and two. And we're having that happen in some of our more uh, mature communities. That's exactly the direction that they're moving in. And Taylor, uh, who's on the call of the meeting with us, and I were just working uh, with, uh, with another one of our colleagues uh, on Wednesday 
uh, on some of those vertical transitions in the elementary schools. So, um, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Akira. But I just wanted to share also as an example of how we make those connections. Um, a couple of communities have, uh, con as part of their transition to K plan or transition to pre-K plan, um, one of their goals is simply to identify families that um, may not be sort of in contact with, with them or with any community so as to reduce the surprise families that come around in kindergarten registration. Um, and so that's one way of connecting it to the transition to pre-K or transition to K goal even. And another example that I wanted to offer was um, in reaching out to families who may have an older child, so maybe they have a fifth grader, and then having those siblings um, be connected to their communities as part of sort of these, these family engagement initiatives um, and, and integrating the transition to pre-K and K in that way. No, that's great. We try to make good. Yeah, thank you, Akira. Those are both really good points. And we do try to make really good connections um, uh, to our the, you know, the younger siblings of our elementary school children and maybe even middle school. But yeah, thank you. Thank you, Akira. I know we're at right at 429. Um, uh, Leanne, I'll turn it I'll turn it over to you if, unless there are more questions. Yes, I just want to know yeah. where do we find the link? I have I do have to go. Yeah. Um, and I just responded, Lynn, but yes, it'll oh. it will be posted, but I'll also send it to everyone who registered for today's session as well. So you'll you'll get it probably multiple ways. Great. Thank you, Leanne. You're welcome. Pleasure talking with you all today. Really appreciate all your attention and good questions. Um, if uh, I, you know, I'm available. If anybody have questions, if they're allowed to contact me, Leanne. Um, the, uh, uh, but yeah, yeah. I'm ha happy during, to be helped. Yeah. So during the RFA, we really um, have to follow the state guidance around questions. So at that point, once it's out, you need to. Um, formally put your questions in writing and we will respond to them um, for you. But if between now and the time that the RFA comes out, you have <laughs> questions, <laughs> you are free to reach to David or to me or to Sue um, and ask as many as you would like. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to make things difficult, uh, Leanne. I'm so used no, to it's offering, a, it's offering just one of those help. formal processes that we are asked to follow. But um, we Understood. find that by holding an informational session ahead of time, recording it, it gives us a chance to preview for you, um, and it and that way you have a better idea of of what to anticipate. Well, thank you very much. Welcome. Have a good Thanks, night. Thanks, everybody.